so in 15 minutes, what can I say? Well, I'm hoping that I'm going to give you some snippets of areas that might inspire you, that might want to explore in conversations throughout the day. So there's quite a sort of diversity of ways I've come at um, my commitment and I think all of our passion to improve care through research providing an increased evidence base. So I'm going to, I like to understand where we've come from. I don't know if that's just because I'm long in the tooth and I'm looking back on my career, but I think I've always been kind of interested in, but in that sort of clarity about how did it start, where are we now, and build on that to the next. Now, some people think palliative care is about this. It's about holding hands, it's about being nice, it's about people being smiley, and that that's where the research happens as well, you know, what what colour nails do people like to have in their, in their hospice? So some people's image of palliative care is, is very narrow about this is an important aspect for sure, well-being, focusing on patient need, um, enhancing quality of life. That's a really important element, but it's not by any means the, the um, only elements of what we do in palliative care, what is needed by patients in palliative care, and therefore where the research needs to be. And I, I, I always go back to Cecily Saunders. Um, I don't know if you do. Um, 1967, she opened St. Christopher's Hospice and started excellent research to inform excellent care and to disseminate that understanding of what happens, what is needed, how we do it through excellent education. So that triad of care, research and education was there from her inception of, of what this endeavour is all about. And you probably can't see the detail of this, but in 1984, they published a paper from St. Christopher's where they'd done post-mortem studies in the hospice. Sorry for those of you that may be a little bit squeamish and it's near breakfast time, but they took people who had died, with their permission, of a bowel obstruction, so something that happened in their abdomen, to try and understand that by having a look inside. And then they published a paper of that series. And not only did that really, really enhance our understanding of what goes on here, it was um, not at all what people had assumed, and it also validated a new approach to managing that clinical context, to give good symptom management in a way that moved away from the traditional approach, surgical approach, um, on wards. So this was 1984, 40 years ago. That was the type of research that was happening in a hospice. And I always go back to that because I think, oh my goodness, we couldn't do that now. We just couldn't, wouldn't. You know, this maybe, you know, pioneers can, can do things, small organizations, and you're, you are very powerful in being actually quite a small number of people that can get together and really move things forward rapidly. You haven't got too many other people to influence. I think that's quite helpful, but that's powerful, isn't it? Hospices have been doing this type of nitty-gritty, unpleasant research it's not the painted nail stuff it is really getting to grips with some of the really difficult problems that make end of life so challenging to deliver to improve for patients so keep that in mind the national kind of rhetoric around research improving care generally this is a quote from the royal college of physicians of london research is good for patients not just the answers that you get at the end, but that endeavor is good for patient. So the care of patients who participate in a trial or a study is enhanced, not just because of the new things you're doing, but maybe to do with the attention, maybe to do with the critical kind of um, endeavor that's going on, but also the care of other patients who aren't in that trial, but are in that same organization is enhanced. The whole level goes up because of what you're doing. And then the CQC in their framework for hospitals, do you know what the CQC is? That's the body that 
an external auditor of quality within the NHS. Um, we have them in other things like schools and things as well, but they come in and it's a big deal and they're going to scrutinise you and you need a rating that doesn't say requires improvement. So the CQC have different domains and one of them is about well-led and within that they want to see that patients are having the opportunity to be involved in cutting edge research because they know that that is a marker of really good practice. And the bit in colour there is our, at the hospice, um, latest unannounced CQC inspection that picked out one area of outstanding practice which was about research and service improvements. So it is highly regarded as really important for a high performing organisation. So that is kind of the top down drivers, isn't it, for us. Let me give you an example of how I think at our hospice, being involved in research improved all patient care. So the iMind study was a study in uh, motor neurone disease focusing on frontotemporal dementia. So people that got um, impairment of the way that they were thinking and some of their behaviours alongside their difficulties in their muscle use. Um, and they developed an online resource for families to help them cope with changes in behaviour in, because of this um, part of motor neurone disease. Um, but alongside that, it required, the research required the care team who were providing care for those patients to understand that resource that was available to some of the people that would be involved in that research. But because of that, all the patients then had a care team that really understood how to support the families and the patients who were in that context. So a very direct example of where research brought new clinical skills and improvement in quality of care. So research is good for patients. So becoming research active, now I guess you are all involved in research here, but some of you may be from those five organisations um, in Mary's survey, in the survey that said, I want to be more involved in research. But <clears throat> even if you are already involved, you're probably am going to be more involved in helping other organisations develop that infrastructure. So it's both top down and bottom up. And I enjoy both bits of it. So in my hospice, so Loros is the name of my hospice, they have a mission statement from 1984 where it says, committed to research in order to improve the understanding and practice of palliative care. Now, as someone that's trying to tell, persuade people, tell people, persuade people, um, that we need to do research within our organisation, it's really helpful to have a top-down thing saying, this is what we're about, this is our mission. You, um, it's not just about providing care that enhances quality of life, it's providing, it's about that evidence base. And then we've had documents, this is now a, a, an organisation that doesn't exist, but a really important um, element of their work that, that has con uh, continuance really is research in palliative care. Can hospices afford not to be involved? And it defined the framework that I think you've used in your sort of research aware, research active, research generating, those three levels. Um, were defined within that but that was really helpful as a national document and then the organization called the National Institute for Health and Care Research which is England centric rather than UK both funds research but also is involved in the infrastructure of research and it is very much wanting to see research within palliative care and hospices um, become enhanced. It's just really got on board very recently as to the profile of that. The bottom up bits, we've got patients who want to be definitely able to contribute so that no one has to go through this again. Things that might help. I'll do anything to help someone else very often comes out and there's lots of evidence that patients want to be involved in the opportunities that research offers that meaning to their life or give back. And then we have pioneers, and this was one of my inspirational people, I don't know if you recognize him, Professor Sam Ahmedzai, um, was the first 
academic clinician that I came across when I was a trainee and he um, inspired me. He was doing all sorts of research at, in the hospice, including, I remember very strongly, pet therapy. That was funded by Pedigree Chum Pet Food and there were dogs coming in and we were looking at um, patients' well-being as a result of having the pet therapy. And that's just one of the many strands of the research. He's a very eclectic research um, driver. So bottom-up requires people that have ideas, that are passionate about driving things forward, as well as top-down. You won't be able to read this, but this is kind of my chronology in Leicester. So this is 14 years. So I've been a consultant at the hospice for 20 years, but I really got serious about research um, 14 years ago. And we put forward a proposal to the Board of Trustees. And we've had some peak times and we've had quite a lot of trough times and um, we've had some endeavours that really didn't come to much but keep moving forward, building the momentum, keeping the productivity going. Um, the first step beyond myself and a secretary was to appoint a qualitative researcher. That was my Mm, way that I thought we could get some small projects going, get some momentum, and then the research governance needed to be um, someone who was not going to cut any of the corners that I might have done, because you know doctors, you know, we just get on with that. Um, so I needed someone in the team that would complement that by dotting the I's, crossing the T's, doing the ethics, the other approvals, keeping us safe, keeping the reputation of the hospice safe. Um, and most recently, we formed a, a very strong partnership with the University of Leicester in moving forward our uh, ideas about research and generating research. And here are some points in our income, because you cannot do this without someone giving you some resource. And how do you build that? Um, and some key things for us um, was that the NIHR delivery arm previously called the Clinical Research Network, now changed its name to the Research Delivery Networks, they invested in some research nurse time, so the hospice didn't have to fund people approaching participants, consenting them, getting the data. We then got our first major grant. It took us three to five years to get this. You can imagine the celebration. Um, and uh, this was about thinking ahead about advanced care planning in minority ethnic communities before underserved communities became a theme that is of so importance. So we were at the beginning of that journey, which is fantastic, because that's given us a profile, it's given us other collaborations, that strand of work continues, but it was really hard work to get that. For three to five years of thinking and several kickbacks in, in funding. We have a local benefactor called the Stony Gate Trust who have really allowed us to make a step change in generating research. So we, that's where we've been able to have that relationship with the university that we have funded researchers who are based in the university. So without that, we would not be where we are today. Um, we'd have to be doing something else. And then um, in 23, our research income, other than from that trust, topped 100,000. So that's big money. Most of it comes from the um, clinical research network. So they think, see we're doing good research. They want to keep, make, help us continue to do that. But not all of it comes from there. The sort of studies we're doing at the moment I thought might be interested to you. So we have a fairly unique motor neuron disease study, uh, service. So every person that is diagnosed with motor neuron disease in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland, that's about a million, uh, 1.2 million population. So every patient is offered the opportunity to come to the LOROS delivered service. And I think everybody accepts that. So from the point of diagnosis, people come to the hospice for their ongoing clinical care. Parking's good, that's the main incentive. But also we've got a great multidisciplinary team, not just hospice personnel. The missing element in that is actually the neurologists. But they have said they can keep coming to see them, but actually they've not got much to offer. Why, 
Loros will offer you a lot more in that team. So that allows us also to do a lot of motor neurone disease research. But if your hospice is involved in motor neurone disease, there is quite a lot of research that you could step into. So there's various things there. One of them has just been published in The Lancet about acceptance and commitment therapy in motor neurone disease and the difference, the positive difference that makes to outcome for patients. And we were involved as the only hospice site in that recruiting and uh, collecting data. And actually part of that, because our therapists um, trained in that, there were some people who um, weren't in our service who wanted to access that research that we could support, and one of them was in Northern Ireland. So um, we did that virtually um, in, in her um, both delivery of the intervention but also collecting the data. So that was great. And it just reminded me while I was sitting here and listening to all the accents how much I'd had to tune into that on Zoom with, with the lady who also had a speech um, impairment from her motor neurone disease. Chelsea 2, some of you may be involved in here, and certainly the chief investigator, Andrew Davis, is obviously based in Dublin. This is a the sort of study that we need so many more of um, in the world of palliative care. So it is now open in 80 different places. And to really um, understand the solutions to some of the really difficult, particularly physical clinical problems. We need that size of recruitment. Uh, it's just because of all the sort of attrition and complexities and all the difficulties in palliative care. We have to do big multi-site studies. There are very few of them. There's little expertise. So, and we have people like um, Andrew and Paddy Stone, who you might also have heard of with the PIP study, who are moving on from their careers. Um, and we may lose that expertise, but how do you really deliver a study that includes 80 sites? It's really, really complex. So um, that's something we're doing, and some of you may not be. Uh, sorry, some of you may be. Um, these are two studies that we are involved both as co-applicants, so developing the project, but also delivering them locally. I'm just showing you sort of breadth of stuff that we're doing. And then these are all studies that we have generated and are leading through our, um, partly our relationship with the university, but also our um, academic understanding. So we're doing quite a breadth of different types of research to improve care. Our focus is always on care. If you want to ask me any more details about any of those, happy <coughs> to respond to that. Now, the picture from the UK. Well, it's England. And where do we get our data from? It wasn't a survey. It's things that the National Institute of Health Research record on a database. And that is only in connection with studies that they label as something called portfolio. And it's only studies that um, link to where the patient was consented. So if I identify a patient at my hospice, but I, um, they're taken on by a research team somewhere else to do the consenting and data collection, it doesn't appear in this database. But what we did find by going in and finding all the places that were labeled hospices that had consented patients in 22-23, that there were 57 sites recruiting 681 <coughs> participants across 22 different studies. So it's a bit of a baseline. It's a conservative estimate. There are 217 hospices. So this is about 25% of hospices were contributing in this way in that year. A vast underestimate. Those are the names, but also in the bracket is how many studies they were involved in. So the vast majority were involved in one study. The top 10 recruiting hospices. Now, I could not have predicted that Lincoln, I know that says Lincoln there, would have been the top UK recruiting study, um, hospice. Um, we at Loros are here. Okay. So these bars show the numbers, but also the number of different studies in those shaded colours. So some hospices are recruiting big numbers in one study, that's the majority of hospices, and some are, are recruiting across a whole portfolio of studies such as, as LOROS. And I would say that 
Given the support that we've had, we are mm, the hospice in, the, in England that is recruiting to the broadest portfolio of studies. And that's also in numbers total, but also the types of study. So are they observational ones, one where you fill in a questionnaire usually, um, or interventional ones such as the acceptance commitment therapy where you've got randomization to two different arms and um, a, a lot more intensity of follow-up. So the vast majority of hospices recruiting one to five participants. Um, Lincolnshire, 50, more than 55 in that questionnaire-based study. Um, so you just get a picture of the sort of scale of activity and I'm sure you'll be thinking how does that compare to the survey you've just heard. Am I doing all right for time? Yes, am I? Um, we, in that thing called the portfolio, it is categorised in different ways. Mary alluded to health service research and cancer research. This is formalised in, in labels, but we have a light a step change that the NHR is now going to have a palliative care portfolio. So hopefully where things have been really quite scattered in visibility terms, particularly Department of Health, they can now see all the research that is going on in palliative care in one place. So hopefully that will um, be our new adventure in the UK. These challenges will be familiar to you, and it may be that that drives where, where the uh, societal and the particularly the healthcare challenges are, drives where the research is needed. I particularly always think about the rise in the 85 year plus group, partly because that's going to be me, um, but partly because we know that they are underserved in palliative care, partly because so many of them are in care homes where we've um, not really had a large focus. And our latest en endeavour in, in Leicestershire is a thing called the Centre for Excellence, where we have a, um, a strategic approach to research-driven improvement in care through education, influencing and practice. Thank you, Mary. Okay, thank you very much. Hope that's been useful for you.